Yeah, Father, we want to keep you in our view, Lord. Lord, help us in all the battles that life brings to keep you in view, to see you more clearly. Lord, you are the answer to everything in our lives, Lord. You equip us for life. You help us to lead fullness of life through you. I pray now, Lord Jesus, let the words of my mouth and let the meditations from my heart be acceptable to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, from this basis of worship, may our hearts be open to what you would want to say to us this morning. It can only do us good, it can only grow us, and it can only glorify your name more. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Yeah, we're following on Easter, as, all, as Jacqueline has said and uh, has been mentioned. Really felt that we were to do uh, a series on living a sacrificial lifestyle. That Jesus is not only our example, but our call to that. You know, if you're a born-again Christian this morning, watching this, then you are a kingdom person this morning. You are a son and daughter of the living God. And that means that our attitude, our lifestyle is different because of Jesus in our lives. In accepting Jesus Christ into our lives, not only did our lives change for eternity, but our priorities and our perspective changed here on earth. This new perspective is a kingdom one, not a human one. And we grow in this kingdom perspective through the word of God and the revelation and outworking of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now the Bible quite clearly states that we are in a spiritual battle. And Satan works so hard to get us as born again Christians to see life through a, an earthly perspective, through a human perspective. Because he knows full well, if we are living our lives through a human perspective, we will not live in the fullness that uh, the kingdom perspective that living with Jesus brings. Therefore, for our lives and for this series of living a sacrificial lifestyle, it is so vital that we get a kingdom perspective. And I've got a slide, I've got a picture that I want to show you, which I hope will give us a physical of what I'm trying to explain. You know, this picture is of a face, but if we're standing in a viewpoint on one side, it will be like viewing it on the left-hand side of this picture. And yet again, if we're standing in a different position, we see the fullness of the picture. This left-hand side that is like if we're viewing the kingdom from a human perspective. It doesn't quite make sense. It doesn't all fit together. It's, it is not a true perspective of what his kingdom is like. But if we are positioning our lives and being equipped by the word and led by the Holy Spirit to live a kingdom perspective life, then it is like seeing that same view but from the right hand side. We can see now quite clearly that actually it's a face with all its detail. And we will live a life that is in the fullness of what Jesus Christ has called us to. We will live in the freedom that Jesus Christ has called us to. So it is so important, you know, we will struggle in life if we view what God has called us to from a human perspective. It is like that left hand side. But viewing it in a kingdom perspective, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us will give us a different, more dynamic view of what he has called us to. You know, a kingdom perspective, having hearts, thinking, attitude, mind, action, 
all towards Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means that we will live different. We will live with a clearer understanding of the perspective of what it means to be a born-again Christian living here on earth. And I'm sharing this because, as I've said, it's vital that we see this series, Living a Sacrificial Lifestyle, from a kingdom perspective, from God's perspective, from who we are now in Christ. Because otherwise, even by me saying this morning, we're going to be doing a series entitled Living a Sacrificial Lifestyle, that word sacrificial is going to eek. It's going to feel a bit awkward. It's going to feel a bit gritty. We'll struggle with the word sacrifice. You know, perhaps in this world today, people think the word sacrifice is a bit outdated. It is literally a bit Old Testament. It isn't really relevant for our lives today. And yet, if you think about it, I think we all live a sacrificial life anyway. We're doing it daily, whether that's with our time, with our finances, as parents, with our family. We, we do things that are sacrificed for them in our lives all the time. You know, I can remember when we were moving up to Rugeley from Lewis in East Sussex 22 years ago. Uh, my dad had died five or six years previously and my mum moved to be near us as a family. The girls were young and she was a great help and blessing and we know that we were a blessing to her. But we always said we didn't know if we would ever stay uh, in Lewis for the rest of our lives because we had put Jesus Christ first and foremost in our lives and we wanted to follow him. And so it transpired that he called us to move here to Rugeley. Now, I still remember that day we moved as if it was yesterday. There we were moving and there were the tears running down my mum's face because her family was moving away. And yet we wouldn't have done anything different, not because God is a horrible God and he wanted to make it awful for my mum, but because we wanted to fill, fulfill what he had called us to be and do for him. And my mum visited loads of times after, but it is hard. I think you can look at a current sacrifice is the, um, the sad death of the Duke of Edinburgh. You know, whether you are one for the royal family or not, put that aside and you can see by the media that people have. They can see in this man what a sacrifice he made to enable the Queen to function as the Queen of this country that he was always that two or three steps behind her, but he was so supportive. And that has stood out to people so much of the way that he just lived his life and how they actually admire that. And uh, we were even saying this morning for the service, and I've heard it on the news, you know, there won't be anyone else like him, that his, that type of generation has died, that, that, you know, we won't see people like that again. And it actually made me think, now, there are millions like him on this earth. They're called Christians. And our sacrificial life should stand out to people in the world that we live, just as his life has stood out to people in them recognizing what he gave and actually what a benefit it was in what he gave. And so that should be for our life. But again, if I'm honest, if I think of the word sacrifice, and perhaps if you think of the word sacrifice, your immediate thought is, oh, it's a loss. What am I going to lose by living a sacrificial life? What do I have to sacrifice that I really want to hold on to? Maybe this morning your first thought has been, uh, I don't know if I can live a sacrificial life. I can't obtain what God wants me to be. I struggle to exist. Or perhaps you thought that this series is going to be as exciting as me taking one of those bushes, standing in the corner, beating myself with it, pouring hot ashes on my head and ripping my clothes like I'm sort of uh, the Incredible Hulk in repentance and it's going to be heavy. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, just so, so difficult as a series to go. Why are we doing a series like this in the middle of a pandemic? This is why, guys, we need a kingdom perspective. Because a kingdom perspective of living a sacrificial life actually brings 
freedom, fulfillment and gain. It is now a part of your Christian DNA, whether you like it or not, it is part of our DNA as a Christian. And if we're not functioning fully, living a sacrificial lifestyle, then we are not living as we are called to live in Jesus Christ. But the great thing is, we are not alone in this. God has given us his Holy Spirit to empower us, to enable us to live a life that equips us to be all that Jesus Christ has called us to be. So this morning, I want to lay a foundation by looking at two points, two key elements for this series. The first is holy God, and the second one is sacrifice. So let us try and look at what it means when we talk about a holy God. You know, we understand the attributes of God of love, grace, and mercy, because those are attributes that we can at times and in our lives reflect and see in others. But when it comes to the attribute of holiness, that is unique to God. That is not something we as humans uh, are able to uh, show or obtain as God is. Yes, when we repent, we give our lives to, to Jesus and we are accredited righteousness. But that is not the same as the inherent holiness of God. Exodus 33 says that God is so holy that no one can see him and live. It's like us looking at the sun up in the sky and continuously looking until we go blind. It is that, it is that before our eyes and yet God's holiness in his presence is a million times greater than that. Holiness is such a part of God that it cannot be separated from him. I don't know what good lo God looks like, but if, if we could cut him in half, if we could literally pull him apart to every, every micro part of him, it would be pure holiness. Every single part of God is pure holiness. Not one speck of impurity can survive in his presence. 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. No human is able to meet his standard of perfection. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The root word for, for holy, both in the Hebrew and the Greek, talks about being set apart, sacred, sanctified. God's holiness includes two essential qualities. The first is absolute transcendence. That means that God's existence and experience are beyond our normal and physical experience. It is not something that we can know or have experienced. It is way above anything that we can imagine. He is both unknown and he is unknowable. And yet, he continually seeks to have a relationship with those he has created. His second quality is that he is endless purity. He never deviates. He never deviates from who he is in being that holy God. He is not contaminated, he is not flawless, and he is uncompromised. A.W. Tozer says this about God's holiness. He says, holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. Because he is holy, all his attributes are holy. That is, Whatever we think of as belonging to God must be thought of as holy. God has made holiness the moral condition necessary to the health of his universe. See, our battle with this is that our view of God's holiness will always come from our mindset. And unfortunately, our human language and thought is limited 
And so we cannot comprehend the fullness of God's holiness. But that is why we have the Holy Spirit residing in our lives to enable us to live that life, even if we cannot com comprehend the fullness of God's holiness. In the New Testament, holy or holiness is mentioned some 200 times. So it seems to my little small mind that actually in Scripture, holiness is important to God because holiness is God. And as his church, holiness is no less of a requirement. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. When I was just preparing for this, I was just thinking, have you ever thought why the Holy Spirit is called Holy Spirit? That's his name. We don't say Holy Jesus. Jesus is Jesus' name. But we particularly call, and he is known as, the Holy Spirit. Perhaps that's because his primary work is to convict men and women of their sin. He brings us to repentance and conviction. He drives us to the cross of mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. His role is to change us. See, Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with a living God. And this living God regards us as his children. So it means that his inherent holiness, that means that there has to be a, a, a great uh, significance to take place for our relationship to be true and in uh, uh, with him. You know, if our God is an inherent God, we just can't come into a relationship with him. There has to be an act that takes place for that to happen. And that act is sacrifice. Why, why sacrifice? Because as the Bible tells us, blood is life. If we don't have blood running through our veins, we're not alive, we're dead. And when you look at the Old Testament, every book swings and points to the great sacrifice that was to come that of Jesus Christ laying his life down for each and every one of us. Leviticus 17 verse 11 is the Old Testament central statement about the sacrificial blood that is to be laid down in the sacrificial system. God speaking to Moses declares, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Three things about atonement. The first is it addresses the need for reconciliation in the broken relationship between God and mankind that came about through Adam. Secondly, atonement is necessary because of our inability to remove or deal with sin. And then thirdly, atonement is related and frequently occurs in the context of forgiveness and reconciliation. This next slide shows the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. Once a, once a, a year on the Day of Atonement, in the most holy of places, the holy priest would take an unblemished animal and sacrifice it before the altar. He would then sprinkle the blood of that animal on to the mercy seat. Under that mercy seat were the tablets of stone, and on those tablets of stone were the Ten Commandments, the law of God. While this was happening, God was looking down from heaven, and he could see the law. But when the sacrificial blood was spread on the mercy seat, 
the law a reminder of the sin of people was covered and so atonement acceptable to God was made without the shredding of blood there is no forgiveness Hebrews 9 22 says indeed that under the law almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins hence it needed our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to fulfill the Old Testament sacrificial system all humanity is tainted and corrupted by sin because of Adam God as our holy righteous judge cannot and will not simply overlook sin it is not in his thought or his nature he has seen that it brings destruction to his perfect world that he created God would be an unjust God if he just simply patted us on the head and just said well boys will be boys that is not who God can be or is he is holy as I have said through and through sin breaks the law and the punishment for that is death yet amazingly God gives us his holy son Jesus Christ as punishment for our sins he gave himself for us he conquered sin and death he took sorry he took our punishment to conquer sin and death he did what we could not do for ourselves I just love these verses in Hebrews 9 11 to 18 and I pray Eve to just close your eyes if that helps just the enormity of what God has done for us when it says but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands that is to say is not a part of this creation he did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood thus obtaining eternal redemption the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean how much more then how much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God cleansed our consciousness from acts that led to death so that we may serve the living God for this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promise eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant in the case of a will it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is in force only when someone has died it never takes effect while the one who made it is living this is why even the first covenant was put into effect without blood we see in these verses the link of blood as life applying Leviticus 17 11 to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made verse 12 clearly shows us that the Old Testament blood sacrifices were temporary were only atoning for, for sin partially and for a short time that is why they needed to repeat that sacrifice yearly but when Jesus entered the most holy place he did so to offer his life completely once and for all there was no need for a future sacrifice as had been this is what Jesus meant when he was on the cross when on his dying words he said it is finished 
Never again would the blood of bulls and goats and doves be needed to cleanse us from our sins. It is only by accepting Jesus' blood shred on the cross for us can we stand before this holy God covered in the righteousness of Christ. Jesus Christ has enabled us to have a relationship with God in all its fullness. Yes, there will be a day when we will live completely in that, in that fullness. But we can still on this earth live in a, in a relationship with God that is in the fullness of Christ. Jesus gave himself completely for us we should do no less than give ourselves completely for him. Sacrifice takes us to the heart of the gospel. And it is the essence of the Christian faith. If I asked you to describe one word that described a Holy Spirit filled Christian life, what would that one word be? Perhaps you'd say it was praise, prayer, freedom, mission, witness, kingdom, love. They're all good and they're all biblical. But that's not the word that Paul used to describe what it meant to live a Christian life. He used the word sacrifice. Romans 12 one to two says, he says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what it is, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, Andy Fisher is going to look at these verses in a couple of weeks, but I just want to say two things briefly from this. That therefore that Paul is talking about is because he's pointing back from, from the entire uh, argument that he's been putting from chapter one of Hebrews, uh, uh, that God that we that god has given himself as a sacrifice to us and that we are to live our lives in his saving grace that we are to give our lives entirely to him the second point paul is making is that he's using the sacrificial language of the old testament to show us new life as a christian in christ in presenting our bodies as that living sacrifice he doesn't say present animals as a sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to God. He is saying, let us live our lives as a living sacrifice that is acceptable and holy to God. You know, uh, Tim and I were talking before the service, and Tim was saying, you know, when we're living that life, that sacrificial life, we do, because of our human nature, so often crawl off the altar Guys, we have the Holy Spirit to enable us through repentance to get back to that place where he has called us to be in living a sacrificial life. It is not optional as a Christian. When we were baptized in Christ, we embraced a new life in which we die to our old selves and we now live to him. The goal of our lives now as a born again Christian isn't to fulfill our cultural expectations or worship our own desires, but to follow Jesus and worship God with all our hearts, our minds and our being. Every day is purpose to bring glory to him. When we are living a lifestyle that is as one of a living sacrifice to him, we get to embrace the fullness of his will for our lives on earth. 
So my prayer for this series is that we will see it through a kingdom perspective. And in seeing it through a kingdom perspective, we will gain the fullness and freedom that it brings in living that lifestyle. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ this morning. Can I say to you, he can only do you good. He can only do you good. His life laid down for you will enable you to live a life in the fullness of freedom in Christ. And all it takes is to repent of the sin that we were born into because of Adam. Now our declaration this morning, it says, Holy Spirit, help me to live my life holy and acceptable to God. It isn't rocket science. We've been given the Holy Spirit. He can enable us to live a life that is holy and acceptable to God. We cannot do it in our own strength. So, say this as a declaration, but also say it as a prayer as we say this together. Holy Spirit, help me to live my life holy and acceptable to God. Let's say it again. Holy Spirit, help me to live my life holy and acceptable to God. Repeat that. Repeat that so it becomes not just words, but a truth in our heart. Now next week we'll be looking at sacrifice being a heart issue. And so can I just ask you in this week to come, you read 1 Samuel 15 in preparation for that. Yeah, let us just pray. Father, we just thank you for all that you've done in our lives. I thank you that our lives are different from when we lived without you in our lives. That that day we gave our life to you, everything changed. Not just for eternity, but in attitude and lifestyle on this earth. And I thank you that you have equipped us to live a lifestyle because you know how good it would be, how good it is for us, how fulfilling it is for us. But you've enabled us to do that by giving us your Holy Spirit that lives within each one of us. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you will minister to us, that you will encourage and empower and enable and equip us to live in the fullness of who Jesus Christ has called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.